Thanks very much, Rebecca. And thank you to everybody for coming out this afternoon. I heard somebody in the toilet saying, right, off to the graveyard shift now. <laughs> so thanks a lot for that. Um, I'm going to um, talk today about Scotland's urban past. Um, I'm sure everybody's had a fantastic day today. Um, what I have gathered is that there's quite a few projects on the go that are kindred spirits to us. I don't know if anybody was at the Manchester District Music Archive session yesterday. Hands up, anybody? Yeah, great. Um, they're definitely a kindred kind of project to Scotland's urban past in that they're gathering information from the crowd and from the people uh, as we are. Uh, also, um, shout out London. Was anybody in that session earlier today? Shout out London? No, one, a few, <laughs> not many. Um, again, it's great to have all these sort of kindred projects to your own projects all together in one space and be able to share information. Um, so today's question, uh, who are the experts? Well, I guess I think initially when heritage studies were in the infancy, we kind of thought about a lot of gentlemen in Tweed who went round the countryside surveying and recording, and that was brilliant. I mean, there's, we've got a great example of uh, a chap here standing at a hill fort at uh, Habchester. I don't think that he can be Scottish, because if you were Scottish, you wouldn't be wearing that hat, because you'd be chasing it down the hill forever from the wind because of the size of the brim. Um, so in 1908, if we go back to the beginning, um, Edward VII, decreed that we should have an inventory of the ancient and historical monuments in Scotland and constructions connected or with or illustrative of the contemporary culture, civilisation and conditions of life of the people of Scotland from the earliest times to the year 1707 to specify those which seem most worthy of preservation. So this is where it all starts. And how is this going to be achieved? Well, they had desk-based survey, which all of you archaeologists will be familiar with that are in the audience and who are speaking. Uh, they used OS six-inch maps. Uh, now, of course, when we do our desk-based survey, we use the National Library of Scotland's historical map site, which is the finest map library, I think, in the world. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, apart from their six-inch maps, they also used historical sources and their own expertise. This is one of our gentlemen in Tweed who was one of the later people to uh, do research uh, for initial heritage when it initially started, B. Gordon Child. Um, and I think that a lot of our surveyors now, if they could be driven around in a private car with their own driver, would be quite delighted. Um, unfortunately, we don't offer that service now at Historic Environment Scotland because uh, I think it'd be too expensive. So, apart from the desk-based survey, their own knowledge and going around the countryside, this is the key part to me um, because the men in Tweed and the chaps that started up this recognised something else and they recognised that they weren't the only people that had a vested interest in what went on. So these questions, um, they also sent lists and questions to ministers of the gospel, schoolmasters, and such other individuals as might be able to supplement these lists from local knowledge. And I don't know if, about you, but that sounds quite like crowdsourcing to me. And it's also a wee bit familiar because, does anybody recognise this dude here? Anybody? Hands up? No? It's written, written on the bottom, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, Sir John Sinclair of Albstart, who, a uh, fine figure of a man painted by uh, Henry Rayburn there, who started the Statistical Accounts of Scotland, which he began for the amelior amelioration of the people, which is a, just a wonderful word. But again, the statistical accounts were sent out similarly to schoolmasters, ministers of the parish. Again, an early example of crowdsourcing. So from there to here, we're now at Scotland's Urban Past, or SUP, as we like to call it. Uh, 
at Scott Urban Past for the Twitter people, hashtag Urban Detectives, in case anybody's tweeting. Um, we are a five-year HLF project, and we are going to be doing 60 community-led projects, 190 events, 1,500 people gaining new skills, and in actual fact, with that particular target, we are pretty much at it already, even though we've been going for two years. And an aim to have 4,000 people registered on our website. So how are we going to do that? Well, as I said, hashtag urban detective. Um, we are recruiting these urban detectives. And has anybody heard of um, Humans of New York? Anybody heard of that? How many? Wow, the loads, great. Well, instead of Humans of uh, NYC today, you're going to get Humans of SUP. Um, because I want to talk a little bit about some of the actual people that are involved in our project. Uh, this chap here that's about to go down a half pipe is called Kenny from the Venny. Um, and the Venny is a skate park um, which is in Livingston. Um, has anybody any idea how many skate parks are listed in the national record of the historic environment back at Historic Environment Scotland? Any idea? One? Yes, it's one. <laughs> and it happens to be this one. Um, nobody had ever thought that skate parks were worthy of recording. When we're all floating about in our hoverboards in 20 years' time and the skate parks have been demolished, we're going to think, that was a bit of a shame that we didn't record any of them. So we went to the Venny and the lads who are there ended up measuring, recording their skate park, which they themselves had um, campaigned to get money to actually build their skate park, which considering that a lot of them were cutting school and a bit disaffected with life in general because maybe education wasn't suiting them, was a real achievement for them. And not only that, but Kenny, who you can see here, who's an apprentice mechanic, went to Heritage and Diversity Conference and led a roundtable discussion about who is heritage for, what sort of people is heritage for, is it for the, the skater boy in the skate park or is it just for middle class people, which is really interesting and that is something that came out of Scotland's urban past and also they made an absolutely cracking film about the skate park that they shot entirely themselves which is on our website which is really worth looking at. Urban detectives can also spontaneously contribute blogs through our website, and this is from the lovely uh, Charlene, who passed on her way to work every morning a statue and just decided, I'm going to research that, I don't know what it is. You can read her blog on our website, but basically it's a statue of Prin uh, Prince Albert, but he's quite weirdly dressed and he's carrying a scroll, so she wanted to know why this was. And then, to her consternation, about a week into her research, a drunk threw a lady's boot up onto the statue and part of her blog became the fact that she had to climb up there with a stick and dislodge it because she was affronted that her monument had now been despoiled with a boot which uh, she said was covered in pigeon poop and went into the bin as soon as she'd left. Um, so that's another way that people can be an urban detective, they can offer up blog posts directly to us. This is another group of urban detectives that we had, the Canongate Banana Club. Um, the Banana Club are based in an area called Dumby Dykes, which is an area of deprivation in Edinburgh that doesn't get a lot of attention. And we went there and we took the kids, some of them, uh, not even as tall as that table there, on a tour of their urban, urban environment with uh, digital cameras that were quite old and droppable. And um, then we got them to look at different textures, do worksheets. They absolutely loved it. Uh, this is Cami, um, who built, with a bit of assistance, um, a cardboard model of an old laundry, which is next to their uh, club, which has now been converted into a, a community venue. And he was really pleased with himself. He said, I can't believe I've done this. I'm only five. <laughs> um, <laughs> which showed a bit of self-awareness, actually, for a five-year-old. But a lot of these kids um, were living on a very deprived housing estate and we had a great time with them and they made models of where they lived and hopefully maybe in the future I might remember that they did that with us. 
Uh, this is Abbott House in Dunfermline, which is our community venue, uh, which is a building from the 1540s. And it has an amazing history, which you can look up, but also it's got amazing murals in it. Um, it has murals by the artist Alistair Gray, and it also has a number of World War II murals in its cafeteria uh, of airplane scenes, which look very reminiscent of the typical um, come to Skegness type posters that were very popular in the 30s. It's that kind of style. And unfortunately, they were being funded by the council. They got word that they were going to close and they got in contact with Scotland's Urban Past. And we sent a SWAT team, basically, to record and film and take pictures of the murals. We had photographers going along on trolleys, taking photographs of the ceiling and we taught them how to record their own building. Um, we also did an oral history session with them where people that had been working there for ages were able to say their piece because some of them had been working there for 20 years. People had been coming to classes for ages and it was a wee bit of almost like a bereavement to some of them that the place was closing down. So through our urban detectives programme, we were able to get their voices heard about the other side, not just the usual heritage voices about the history of the building and, and the fact that it's from 1540, but what it meant to people to live around the building and work inside it and also to record the more recent um, aspects of the building, which were the murals and paintings that were inside. This is Idris from the Glasgow Disability Alliance, who are a group that we've worked with through my colleague Nikki. Nikki, stick your hand up over there. She'll be going round with the roving mic later. Um, they're a group that we've worked with to record their environment. And something that we did with them is we gave them training in filmmaking and oral history recording. Uh, I got them to think about their environment. Now, Idris uh, is a big football supporter here. And I thought it's really interesting to get people's, other people's perspectives. His favourite building is the football park where he goes, uh, but not surprisingly only because he likes the football, but because he said it's got the finest disability access of any building he's ever been in. So to him, he goes into that building and he doesn't have to think about the building. He doesn't have to stress about how he's getting in there or how it's going to be when he's there. He just literally has to sit back and enjoy the game. So we've trained them and this young, they're a young group, so everybody's under 30. Come next year, they're going to start interviewing older people with disabilities to get them to tell their stories of what it was like to live in an urban environment many years ago as a disabled person. And we're going to get the young people with disabilities to interview the older people with disabilities. Again, through our Urban Detectives programme and our free training that we offer, we're able to go out and reach out to a lot of community groups like this and hopefully make their voices a bit better heard. This is one of my favourite pictures that we've got from our Urban Detectives. Also from the Urban Detectives point of view, you can upload your own information in a normal crowdsourcing way. So we've seen with other groups today that you can go to our website upload images, upload text. Uh, this is Betty. Uh, that's the lady on the left in the red, um, not the ladies on the right. And this is Miss World Day at Woolco in Cumbernauld, which was a department store owned by the Woolworth Company, which is sadly not there anymore. Uh, so Betty couldn't be there in person. She's very elderly. She's had a stroke. We had a bit of a scanathon at Cumbernauld during their doors open day and she sent a lovely letter along with a person from the press uh, who gave us this press photograph and allowed us to upload it. And this is Miss World Day in Cumbernauld in 1975 um, with the lovely furry furniture and Betty who'd said that she was really, really nervous because Miss World was coming and everybody in Cumbernauld thought that she was the absolute epitome of glamour. Uh, and that Betty had stood there really nervous just waiting for Miss World to come along. And so this is people's remembrances. I mean, not only is this an amazing piece of social history, but Woolco isn't even there anymore. And people were coming to us in the Cumbernauld Open Day with piles of things saying, 
we thought you wouldn't want this. We, don't, we didn't think this was important. And yet, we don't have hardly any of this type of thing in the National Record of the Historic Environment. This is St John's Tower Air. This is a community group who live in the street that you can see behind the tower there. They've got a Cromwellian tower in their street, which wasn't, it's only open one day a year. The council aren't really that fussed about it. They were getting a lot of antisocial behaviour surrounding it. So we worked with them to uh, make a film and rewrite the guidebook for the tower in the hope that people can maybe respect the space a bit better and also to lobby their council to see if it could be open a bit more than just one day a year on doors open day. I'll just go back there um, just to say that's uh, Sheila and Peter who are from the community group with uh, Danny who's our other training officer wearing the rather fetching hat there today. Um, this again came from Cumbernauld. Uh, this is 42 Parkway, which is a kind of a modernist inspired uh, housing estate for professionals. And it's so rare that we get um, interior shots. And for aficionados of mid 20th century furniture, this is just an absolute cracker. Um, the little, it's really showing you how the people are living in the space and they're using the space. It's not just an an architect shot or a recorder shot of somebody that's just gone in and, and taken a photo of the interior. They're living in it, they're using it, and it's very, very evocative of its time uh, with the lovely Lucian Day inspired curtains and the mid 20th century furniture and everything. And again, um, the Johnson family came along to us at Cumbernauld with a whole bunch of stuff that they wanted us to upload for them, and they've done that. Uh, now their memories are there in perpetuity. Um, not only is that interior set not there anymore, but the whole um, block that they were brought up in is gone. So, unexpected benefits. Uh, this is Niall Rogers, who was diagnosed uh, with cancer a few years ago and wrote a very in intriguing blog about w walking his urban area in order to combat his uh, feelings that he had and his health around the cancer issues. It's called Walking with Sea. Um, I heartily recommend it. Also, um, Heritage Counts 2014 said that visiting historic towns and cities has an immense impact on people's well-being. But what we're trying to tell people is that all of your towns and cities are historic. If you just want to look and research, they're all historic, not just the ones that we think of as being historic. So why would you want? Do you want why do we want you to do this? Well. You're telling your own story. It's a snapshot of what matters to you. You're caring about your place. It's also community empowerment. And with the Community Empowerment Act Scotland as well, this kind of thing, and getting people to look at their environment is helpful for community empowerment. And as I've said, walking around your urban environment is a good thing. It's forever. Uh, we're a five-year national lottery project, but everything that is coming in through Scotland's urban past is going to go into the national record of the historic environment, which is going to be kept at Historic Environment Scotland er, in perpetuity. So it's not going to go away after five years. All of the information that we gather from the public is going to stay. Everyone can do it. You can upload stories, text, images, drawings, ephemera. We've talked about that already today in some of the groups. Oral histories, films from all over the world, as long as they're to do with urban areas in Scotland, now and it will be available in the future. Just register with us at SUP. So here we are, 20, 226 years of crowdsourcing. 1790, we had the first statistical account. 1879, the OED reading programme. Has anybody heard of that? Oh, I thought I'd better put it in because I was sure somebody would say, what about the OED reading programme? They asked for readers in 1879 to identify new words for the dictionary. Uh, 1908, the inventory of ancient and historic monuments. And finally, in 2016, all the way round to Scotland's urban past. Thanks very much. <laughs>